I'm Susie Maloney, and I am the screenwriter of Bright Hill Road, and this is the film craziest show. I am Robert Cuffley, the director and composer of Bright Hill Road, and this is the film craziest show. Hi, my name is Colin Sheldon. I'm the producer of Bright Hill Road, and uh, we are on the film craziest show. Awesome. It's great to have you guys. Thank you. And, Thank you. And I'm Daniel, the, the host of the Film Crazy Show. <laughs> um, curious, uh, curious to start with um, the Brand New Road itself. It looks like such a cool building. How how did you guys find that? That's you, Colin. Uh, yeah, well, it was um, one of the other producers, Alicia. She um, had been working on another project and doing a lot of scouting throughout rural Alberta, and um, and so when we needed a hotel. Uh, one of the issues with finding the right look was that if it's too close to a major city, then it's either been demolished or it's been turned into condos. So we were looking in kind of small town Alberta to try and find kind of the right look for what we needed. And, uh, and she came across uh, the hotel in Staveley. So um, that's where we, we ended up shooting. It was, uh, it was a great little town to shoot in. Okay, how, how big is the town? Um, um, with with the crew there, I think it's twelve people. <laughs> I think it's five hundred. It seems to me I check those things. I love populations, so. Okay, cool. That's why I asked. I like little. I like knowing how big the towns are too. I do too. You must have lived in some small places then. Honestly, not really. But I had like a trailer park in Eganville, in Ontario, which is like twelve hundred people. Yeah, okay, yeah. Now I like uh, I like knowing how big a place is. Okay, cool. Um, also, why why a boarding house and not like a hotel or a motel? I'll take that one. Uh, so when we were uh, setting this up, uh, the original idea was that it was a boarding house, but we were, I I left it open somewhat because I thought if we had to use a house, we could probably mock that up to look like a boarding house but we were unlikely to be able to mock up a house to look like a hotel. And so I also knew that, you know, we were going to look for something decrepit. Um, it's described in the script. And so I did figure that um, even if we did get a hotel, it would still look like a SRO, you know, single room only kind of place. And so it just felt more flexible to me. Um, as far as, I don't know if you've ever been in any boarding houses or stayed at the Y somewhere, or, um, but I have, I've visited people in boarding houses and I've, and there is, there's something about the atmosphere of a place that has transience, like in its very DNA, that is just scary. It's just automatically atmospheric. And it, part of it, I think is because, you know, all of this, in human energy, the, the soul, if you will, the essence of people coming and going. And like, if you've ever been in the Chelsea Hotel, that place is just like reeks of atmosphere and it also smells, but it mm -hmm. certainly of atmosphere. And I think it's just, you know, the nature of transience that it, it, you leave a little bit of yourself everywhere you go. I really like that. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. It was a very long answer to a very- No, it's good. It's good. Awesome. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna have everybody's attention this whole way. I'm pretty sure <laughs> these are great answers so far. Um, the, light. <laughs> the, the the lighter. <laughs> did did you bring uh, any of that experience with you staying at um, boarding homes into the script? Uh, me, I certainly tried to. Like I I certainly I have lived a lot of places, and I've lived almost always in really old places that lots of people have lived in before me. And um, you know that feeling when you're going into a house or you, you, know, you immediately get an idea of that family, you know, you smell their crappy cooking, you, you know, you see what, what's in the laundry basket that's at the bottom of the stairs, et cetera. And so I like to think that part of my job as a writer is absolutely to absorb those sorts of details and those sorts of ideas that come out of those details. You know, oh, there's um, that laundry basket is full of baby clothes. There's a baby in this house. That laundry basket has a, a t-shirt in it with a suspicious red stain. You know, all of these things you can kind of pick up. 
and you take it wherever you go, whatever you're writing, you're putting bits of those things in there. So I imagine anytime, I stayed in a super sketchy hotel in New York once called the Novell Hotel, not Novala, which is another fancy hotel, but the Novell. And the walls were obviously uh, one sheet of plywood or one sheet of drywall between these rooms. You could hear the breathing of the people in the next room. And, um, and that's what I kind of imagine being in a boarding house at some point in your life, you know, that's the lowest of the lowest kind of living arrangement, the SRO. And now I forget the question. So. so Daniel, can you just direct all your questions to Susie because she's on her <laughs> Okay, I will. I am not. Ask Robert, ask Robert questions about movies. Yeah, okay. No, I was curious to stay on though, just a hotel, because like I usually try to have uh, a couple of fun questions. Um, and this is my only one, just if everyone wants to answer. Um, have you had any like really bad hotel experiences? I have in uh, Taipei. Uh, I checked into a room uh, probably at 3 a.m. and I was just super tired and the door opened. What what comes to your mind if I say George Romero's Creep Show? Oh, the cockroaches. So it, now you're thinking two or three? No, without exaggerating, I saw without looking around, I saw about three dozen cockroaches. And it was so revolting that uh, and I was so tired, I just fell face first on the bed and uh, I had to get up in the middle of the night to pee and it was <laughs> like dozens, maybe hundreds. So that's my, oh, did you say worst? Because that was one of my best experiences. <laughs> no, it was, it was horrible. So top that, you guys. Go ahead. Drop, drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is no talking that. I did have that, so that um, that hotel, the Novell, that place you could actually see where they had cut the drywall around to fit against the uh, the floorboard of the of the the wall or the baseboard, and you could literally hear. But wait, it gets better. I was visiting I was visiting uh, New York with my two male friends uh, who were a couple, and we were on a budget, as you can imagine, in New York City, and. Uh, I had to share a bed with them. So I don't know, it's not quite a mug drop because, but I'm absolutely certain there were cockroaches there. New York, yeah. But, but we were quite involved with some substances and so we slept quite heavily. So I don't, yes. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything as bad as, uh, as Robert's for sure. But, uh, but yeah, we were in a hotel in California and there were <clears throat> quite a few cockroaches that were scurrying around. Um, it's always pleasant. They're so fast too, hey? you forget how fast. Yeah. yeah. And they're yeah. just trying to live their lives, guys. You know, I don't know, you're, that's their room. Yeah, we're intruding <laughs> on Burgess territory, yeah. <laughs> you walked into their room. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. We're the ones paying, but they're the ones we have to leave. And yeah. you're freaking out. Who is this guy? His feet are huge. Watch out, we lost Bradley, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, take it, Susie. <clears throat> I feel like insects are the common theme here. Because, yeah, I was at an, I don't think it, was, it wasn't a hotel, but it was an Airbnb, and there was a huge centipede in the bathroom in the middle of the night. Oh, those are so frightening. It was taking a shower. Guy was naked. <laughs> no, that would have been worse. I was, I was fully clothed, thankfully. No, he was naked. Did no. he do the look when you walked in? <laughs> Is that what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. Oh, <laughs> that's this. This is gonna be fun. I can I can tell already. <laughs> okay, nice. I was curious. Um, oh well, no. Now that you that now that you said it was filmed in a small town, I I guess it wasn't filmed exclusively in Calgary. Then no. Um, we, we, one day where we shot um, the her apartment and the workplace was all. I'm in Calgary near downtown. And then, yeah, the, everything else was shot out in, in Stavely. Talking about, speaking of the workplace, I, I appreciated how, um, like, the workplace shooting wasn't used as, like, exploitation, but instead as just a trigger for trauma, if you wanted to speak to that, Susie, I guess. Uh, you know, 
It's funny that you say that. We, we had a limited amount of time to write this. And so the original scenario was a school shooting. She was a counselor, which I found slightly more ironic for being a counselor. Um, but immediately, I think within days of me writing that scene, uh, Robert and I in discussion, just, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't do that. For one thing, school shootings had um, become such a, such a constant theme in real life that it didn't seem you couldn't use it in any way for a movie like that and workplace shooting just fit more perfectly and and she could be hr of course again is very similar to counselor she's a you know a hirer and firer of people and she's the last person who should be making any kind of choices in somebody else's competency so uh so yeah we yeah it worked and i think that robert kudos to him for not exploiting it Okay. Did you did you have anything to add to that, Robert? <clears throat> um, yeah. So it, it's a, a galvanizing incident at the beginning for sure. But it, I also liked how I liked how it showed how deep she was uh, submerged into her alcoholism. As to not to give anything away, but it is the first four minutes of the movie to run to the bathroom to vomit, so intoxicated or so hungover that she barely notices the shooting. So I really liked that. And I liked it from uh, the sound perspective of trying to balance what's going on in her head. And you know those moments when you've got to throw up and, and just everything gets cloudy for a few moments. Well, that's her staggering to the bathroom. And there's a, a huge kerfuffle going on, obviously. There's gunshots. And I just love that uh, melee of all this chaos happening at once, especially the start of film, because it's it's like, boom you're in it uh no exposition just boom it's it's kind of refreshing that way okay yeah the, the out of focus like those little aspects like throughout the film like that was used effectively just just the disorientation of it mm -hmm. yeah uh that that was uh I'm, I'm always wary with stuff like that not to use it just because we have it the tools um, but it, it seemed to work metaphorically work for the, the haze that she's lost in um, as she's uh, drinking, then detoxing, then drinking. So just everything's foggy. And that played into the mystique of the hotel, I think, because part of you is wondering, is that alcohol stupor induced vision hallucination or is that a legit supernatural presence? And I like that uh, those two questions circling the viewer's head at the same time. Okay, now the the never ending booze, uh, the, the just the never ending bottle that just refills magically. Like I feel like that would be fun for a lot of people, but that was just interesting <laughs> here <laughs> to to be used. What was what what was the idea behind that? Um, if I can take that, uh, I it, it was actually supposed to be a new bottle of wine each time one relieved, and I think that I read this thing and I used it in a novel. I, I come from the world of novels. Okay. Someone had told me once that the difference between somebody who drinks normally and an alcoholic is that the alcoholic is not interested in the drink they have. They're interested in the drink that's- Oh, that's so true. Yeah, and so um, to me that bottle is, that's both the, you know, the, the, that's the worst thing that can happen and the best thing that can happen. So it's that. And there's another one that is one drink is too many and a thousand's not enough or something is another. Um, and, and so that's what I was using all the time that what if there was just this never ending supply of alcohol, you know, like leaving Las Vegas, you could just drink yourself to death. And, you know, all that would be left for you to, to keep you from doing that would be your own will. Okay. Yeah, I find that interesting too. I remember the first time I realized uh, I've got alcoholism in the family, as I'm sure many people do, but my friend uh, Donnie, we'll call him, we were at a, a club, like I was probably 20, and I had a beer and I finished it and he said, he's looking at me weirdly, and I said, what? And he goes, how, why, why would you just have one? And I was like, what? And it took me a second, then I'm it just gave me a gateway into his, his mind. And it's so true what Susie just said. It's an invisible noose around your neck that's pulling you against your will. But sometimes, see, I can sound smart too, Susie. That's pulling you <laughs> <laughs> towards something that you're, you know, uh, simultaneously 
reluctant to go in that direction, but also staggering towards it at the same time. Um, I don't know about any of you guys, but I was a cigarette smoker. And um, I compare, and many of the, you know, the moments of the craving and the giving in that's, that is in that script come from my own experiences, having been an addicted smoker. And it's been many years since I've done it, but you know, you're, you're always one cigarette from re-addicting. So you just, you can't do it. And that's so fast. Uh, Daniel, pull us in if you need us to stop uh, going uh, on a tangential path, but- I love sorry. tangential, don't worry. <laughs> that's, uh, it, it's endlessly fascinating to me. Um, I remember my first film, Nicholas Campbell, and I asked him, he was taking a cigarette and I said, okay, I, I, I'm not a smoker. Uh, I'm not an alcoholic. I have other vices, but I just said, I want you to play this. Like this is the first one you've had in four months. And he just did it beautifully. And I remember a friend of mine saying exactly what Susie just said, like you're just one away. But then there's people like my stepdad that can quit overnight and not even gain weight. And he's like, oh, no, I just dropped it. So- <laughs> My son and my husband too. I'm sure that's infuriating yeah. for people that struggle to quit. I, I just, thank God I'm not addicted to that because what a terrible thing. But it is wonderful in terms of uh, exploring it in cinema, for sure. For sure. Yeah, and like like my grandmother was like a chain smoker. She just finished one and then just already have the other next one lit. So that's, yeah, that's fascinating in film as well. That's what every smoker wants to do. Every smoker just wants to just constantly be smoking. But, you know, you know that it's a deadly habit even when you're only doing having two a day, like you just have to get it out of your life. I, I'm not. Yeah, Colin is heroin the same. Colin's a heroin addict. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> you, know, you can go to the source. Susie and I are just talking about people we know, but talk to an actual addict. Like right there. I'm sorry, Colin. Colin is the opposite of a heroin addict. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I should say, Daniel, one of the things I loved is that I hadn't seen a lot of, actually, I hadn't seen a single female protagonist that's an alcoholic as the lead in a film. So that definitely, uh, I'm sure it wasn't just me, but it, it, it was, uh, it pulled me in and interested me right off the top because how do you make her sympathetic or empathetic? Um, are people going to be rolling their eyes at her attempts? You know, because so many people know. Uh, I certainly had it uh, growing up. It's like, done, I'm done, full stop, I'm done. These huge pronouncements, and then the next day, starting again. And uh, she, you know, so her viewers gonna roll their eyes at that, uh, or are they gonna be sympathetic? And um, Siobhan Williams, who played that uh, character, Marcy, or the lead in Bright Hill Road, somehow, and this is what I uh, am so fascinated with actors, just, she did a pretty effort, effortlessly, which uh, always, captures my imagination, just how they can turn on that ability. But she was so good, and I'm sure you know, you shoot movies out of sequence, so good at uh, uh, both of us. I tried to help her track where she was at in terms of what stage of withdrawal or drunkenness. But she, man, she was so good. She really was. Absolutely. Okay, so it was easy, easy. sorry, how do you pronounce her name? Shaban? Shaban, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've always seen it spelled, but I was like, okay. And like before I was like, is it Sayohoban or Shabon? Shabon makes more sense. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but it was easy for her to like um, play to the trauma of the character and play to the paranoia as well. Then uh, I don't want to say easy because okay. uh, it was her doing it, not me. Uh, I was just there to coach her a little bit, but uh, she sure as hell made it look easy. Yeah. Which is a feat in itself, right? Especially on such a tight time frame, this was shot in less than half the time I've ever shot a, a feature before. And uh, her just keeping up with how fast I wanted to move and not compromising in her delivery was very, it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty spectacular. Okay. I don't want you to speak for her, but was, was this her like first experience with a smaller indie, I guess, in a way? Um, I shouldn't speak for her, but I, I think, like, honestly, we're not going to say how small, but this was very small. Okay. So it may have been her first, but honestly, we know that um, it doesn't look as small as it was. That was, that's my chief job. So I don't consider, even though I know it was a small film, it doesn't have the feel of a super small film, I don't think. So um, 
Siobhan, yeah, series, movies. This is probably the smallest thing she's done, but again, I don't want to speak. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm very immature. So that's just in my mind, that's just a whole bunch of, that's what she said jokes. <laughs> oh, I can. You have found your people then, sir. <laughs> I, I could imagine every single one. I'm just gonna edit all that. Just be like, okay, like out of context. <laughs> yeah. I, couldn't help I, back was, I always end things with that's just what happened at our wedding. That's another one too. Oh, that's, I haven't heard that one. And yeah. I like that. Okay, I couldn't hold in the giggles. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, I'm just gonna look at my question, see where I want to go next with this. Um, yeah. now are are you guys okay with talking spoilers, or would you rather avoid that? Uh, I'd rather avoid it. Okay. Yeah. Can I, can I ask three that will dance around spoilers, but they're just kind of yeah. they couldn't get into that territory. But we'll 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 dance around them. Um, how long did it set up to? How long did it take to set up that room with all the, the the bottles? Is 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 that a spoilery? Is no, that that's in the trailer. Okay. Is it oh. in the trailer? Okay. Oh, and how long did that take? Do you remember? Um, well, um, my brother, Carl, was the one that did the production design, and um, he was very convinced that that was one of the pivotal scenes. And so we, we literally went to several bottle depots and bought back bottles from them so that we could litter the room with them. And uh, it, it took a lot of time to, to get to them. Setting them up was somewhat easy, though. Then we had during production, of course, we had a bottle break and so now there's glass and it, it was it was challenging but um but visually it, it's it's pretty brilliant you know i was there for that i was only three days on that set and but i happened to be there uh when they were turning that room into that and uh i helped everybody helped a little um, I was extraneous, like I, I had, you know, no place there. So I did try to help whenever I could and just setting up all the bottles and Carl was working like a machine, like he knew exactly visually what he saw and what he wanted. And, you know, he, he, he didn't waver from it. He made sure everybody was doing what he had requested. And it, it was a sight to behold because, you know, when you write a scene like that, you think you have sort of an idea of what it would be like and what he did exceeded my expectations. Okay. Now for, was that, did you visualize that as like a lifetime supply of, of bottles or like a month stupor? It's what she's drank. It's supposed to be like just a, an absolute image of what she's like, her accumulation of alcohol. Okay, since she got to the boarding house. Just in general. Um, okay. I never took it as literal, but yeah. okay. Yeah, it's a thing she sees. Okay, I, I didn't take it to less literal until right now, where I was like, oh, I don't know if you had you had thought of it literally, Susie. But okay, fair enough. Who cleans up this place? What a terrible hotel. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they no. have all the bottles. Yeah. Now, uh, Colin, what what was it like working with your brother on this? Um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, we've done. Um, some corporate stuff together and short films. This was the first feature that we worked on together. Um, and uh, it was a real enjoyable experience. Okay, cool. Um, I, 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 this, I don't know if this is a spoiler either, but I feel like it stays on the topic of production design. Um, but the room with the candles, did, did you guys need a fire marshal on set for that that day? Um, no, we did have like have a fire extinguisher on standby. Um, and then, I mean, there are obviously some real candles there. There's also a lot of battery operated candles. And then there's also some CG candles that are all mixed in together to create okay. the look. Okay. I, I believed all of them are real. So that's, that's why I asked. Oh, good. good. Okay. No, we were, we were very safe the whole time, for sure. And if, if someone's going to get hurt, I would make sure it's not the crew, it's one of the cast. Okay. Now, if if that's, like, a question of... Oh, sorry, what'd you say, something, Susie? <laughs> <laughs> he offered up some crew as sacrifice there. Wait a minute. He lost right over, Daniel. So you just don't care about actors, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, I missed that entirely. What's going oh, on? I just said if anybody was going to get hurt, it would be crew, not actors. No, actors. Oh, 
Okay. The actors my crew, yes. Sorry, crew. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask, though, um, if, if that's like a question of legality that will get you guys in trouble, I can cut that out. But no, not a Collins. Collins, right? We were completely safe. Okay. Uh, yeah. More we, there, there was a path for her to walk through, and then we just filled it in with battery candles or or CG. So, yeah, it was entirely safe the whole time. So, okay. independent filmmakers out there, and uh, I know of one right now that's not being safe. That's shooting in this uh, area, and there's you have to, that's that's paramount. That's at the very, very, very top. You can't have the actor do anything that's not a hundred percent safe. Not just for legal reasons, but because, uh, well, safety, obviously, but the word spreads and you just do a disservice to all your fellow producers and directors. Okay. Um, now, this this might get into the most spoilers of, the, of these questions, but we can dance around it for sure. I, I phrase it as, for Inman, does she ever get much of an off-season, so to speak? <laughs> From her job, you mean? Yeah. Um. Well, you, you touch on something interesting because um, we're seeing these people for a fragment of time, but what do they do year round? And, and I like that your mind is going that way. Um, but Susie, do you want to speak to this? I will, because, you know, I have, um, I have a prequel to Bright Hill Road in my head. Okay. Of course I do, right? Because that's how backstories are created. And I feel like she would be an excellent backstory. You know, it's the, it's the backstory for the hotel. It's the, you know, it's her personal backstory. It talks a little bit about the, uh, the, the bullet hole in the wall. And, um, and it's funny during shooting while I was there that very short period of time, um, Colin wanted to know, we were standing on the road when they were shooting the, the car. And Colin said, so do you have a sequel? And immediately went, I have a prequel. <laughs> and so, but of course we, we've not even discussed doing that, but yeah, she's got a fantastic story. And of course the idea for having an off season circumstances being what they are in the hotel is of course um, impossible. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we won't speak any more of it then. <laughs> Let us never speak of this. The life of a screenwriter, am I right? <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Um, now this was. I'm not trying to criticize the writing, but I. Was, uh, this is a this is a loaded one. Um, like I thought the horror sequence in the basement was great, but I was just. I don't know if I got like the sense of why she went into the basement that first time, and I was just wondering if that was like the 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 hotel in a way controlling her thoughts, or. She, the the first time she goes into the basement, it's just part of exploring. Okay. She's bored, and that got changed a wee little bit, and I forget if it was because of time or something we couldn't do. Robert, do you? I no, I well, unless I, you can tell my memory, but I, I think it was she's she's literally crawling the walls. Yeah, after she quits drinking. And there's nothing in this town. There's no Cineplex or Starbucks. So she's basically, what do you do? You explore the confines of the house and the basement is, is a huge area. She's not expecting to find what she does, but I think it's natural curiosity that takes her down there. And you know, you don't, you don't want uh, the horror trope where don't go in that room, but to be fair, she doesn't know what's down there. Okay. Okay. I think initially a scene that did not uh, make it into the final script was she was in the kitchen, which the basement door is off of, and the door just kind of creaks open and mm. she goes and looks and then she goes down. But in fact, uh, because of um, where we were shooting, et cetera, we didn't have the correct setup for that. And so we just had her go down, I believe is what happened. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess just for me, where I was coming from as a fan, it just seemed as like a horror fan just seemed like she went there arbitrarily a little bit. So yeah. I guess um, like the second time when the um, Inman says, oh, uh, there's some old magazines in the basement. I was like, oh, okay. I like, see, that's a good reason to go down, I suppose. See, for me, it was the opposite. And if you find fault in that, it should be with me, not Susie, <clears throat> because we were struggling against a timeline. But okay. to me, um, once you've been down there, 
uh, newspaper articles are not going to be enough to lure me down there. You'd have to drag me kicking and screaming, but it is, it is horror, right? And, and she is a, a super curious person, but she's also in the, in the midst of uh, all these hallucinations that she'd probably like to get to the bottom of. And it's funny, there's, there's this one take, Susie, you don't even know about this, where they didn't make the cut, where she sees that eye behind the door and flees, but instead of fleeing, she actually kicks the door open. And I liked that. I can't remember why it didn't work because it reminded me of nightmares. The only way I could wake myself up is if I stopped being chased, turn around and ran, ran towards the monster. And that's when I would jolt up. So I liked that instead of running away, she was just like, you know, fuck you, kick the door open. But uh, we never ended up using that take. But to answer your question, she's, she's, she's curious for sure. But okay. she's also a spirited person who's, who wants to know what's going on. Okay. Now, I, I hope I didn't sound like I was no, no, not at all. nitpicking too much, but... I'm going to hang up. I am so <laughs> horrified. I'm also, so <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Also, Robert, I don't know if I trust <laughs> you anymore that you, you run towards the danger in your nightmares. <laughs> when I was a kid. Now I just run. <laughs> okay, you've learned. All right. <laughs> well, after the monster's bitten you a few times, you get smart. Keep running, yeah. That's true. That's true. Um, also, I, I had, I had two little sayings that you wrote in the script here, Susie, written down. Um, the first one's not a saying, actually. Um, the idea of the, have a drink on us, those little tags, where, where did that come from? Well, because, um, I have been in hotels, uh, you know, I've toured for, um, my books and such, and they would often be, uh, like a bottle of wine or champagne sometimes, and, you know, it would be a welcome or a congratulations or something. And there was usually a card tucked into the cellophane that welcome to the hotel or congratulations on your book or whatever. I don't know that the hotel supplied it. It's likely my publishers, but there was often these things. And I used to think, well, how festive that is, right? Like, and that's a, you know, an expensive because they'd be these baskets. And plus I was generally there overnight and flying to another city after I did my gigs. And so I would be leaving behind these bottles of champagne and these bottles of wine and these baskets of fruit. What was I supposed to do with it? Stick it in my suitcase? Um, but I always thought it was like a super nice gesture. And, but I turned it on its head where it is a nice gesture, but it's sinister in Marcy's case. And so here's these, you know, bottles of wine. Often if you book a room in a hotel, it's, oh, it's our anniversary. It's my wife's birthday. It's, Groundhog Day, whatever. And so they would supply a, a kind of greeting card that said, happy birthday or whatever. And so I imagined if it was just like this kind of sleazy sales tag, like in a vintage thrift store that said, have a drink on us, you know, happy birthday, have a drink on us. Um, it was the have a drink on us part that I felt was sinister. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Particularly with her. For sure. Okay. Um, Again, a super long answer for a simple question. No, I, I love, I love, long, long cool. answers. like that was the essay question, you know, so <laughs> five out of five. <laughs> um, going off of that, like you, you said you, you'd get like gift baskets. Did you ever collect anything from them or did you just have to leave them all behind? Well, they always came with fruit, chocolate, that sort of thing, right? And I'm sure I would have taken the chocolate and on occasion, I'm sure I would have taken a piece of fruit. Um, but yeah, they would be these great gifts. And I understood that, you know, the publishers wanted me to feel at home in these, you know, hotels. I was gone along to, it was a long tour. Um, but yeah, it was a total waste. Like I, I couldn't do anything with it. Was I supposed to get hammered on a bottle of wine and go do a like the, morning show? <laughs> I like the idea that you would check out and they would just put it in someone else's room. See, like that's sinister. Yeah. Right? Wrapping it back up, tying it, goes to the next room. You know what? You could do a short film that just follows. Yeah. Yeah. This poor bottle of wine that never gets drank. Okay. okay. You're on. Let's do it. That's our next one. That's awesome. Cool. But it's a sad story because it doesn't get drank, and that's its whole purpose. Mm -hmm. nah. Now, okay. I think that's Pixar now. <laughs> that's Pixar now. Little lamp. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and the the mirror is the window to the soul where, where did that come from i like that one 
Okay, that well, it's the eyes are the window to the soul, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, really, when you're reflecting on yourself, you're seeing who you are. And so that's, I twisted it. And to be told to Marcy more than once so that it was about her doing some self-reflecting, which is what the film's about ultimately. Did I spoil? I didn't spoil, did I film? I don't um, think so. I also had this, I, this idea that, you know, your reflection, I mean, do you know the thing that if you're going to have a paranormal experience, a lot of times the way that a, um, a spirit, a ghost, whatever, will reach out to you, the first sighting will be in a mirror. Have you ever heard that? Because that is a thing. Cool. And so I've always loved this idea of reflection being something more than just, you know, reflection, uh, the surface reflection, that there's more reflecting in a mirror. And so when Marcy sees her true self, and let's not spoil there, um, she sees her true self, right? She sees Owen's true self. She, um, and so in this case, the mirror has been the window to the soul. Okay. I am sorry to cut you off, Danielle. I remember something Susie said early on. It didn't make it into the script, but she said um, when she goes to the bathroom in the middle of the night, she never looks in the mirror. Do you remember that? Yeah, because I don't want to see a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love superstitious stuff like that. It's so uh, so fertile for the moment. It's not superstition. Like that's, that's how a lot of people have seen ghosts. Okay, so funny story. Okay. When I first moved to New York, I, I, I've had this, uh, I won't look in the mirror at night in the dark ever. But uh, so when I moved to New York, um, I got up in the night to go to the bathrooms when we were first staying there. And, and I didn't want to look in the mirror because I didn't want to see a ghost. But there was part of my brain going, well, what if it's someone famous? <laughs> what if I get to see Marilyn Monroe or, or you know, <laughs> Sid Vicious? <laughs> We're both together. <laughs> together again, finally. You know, the last last Carnegie Hall show. <laughs> so that so that was a real thought I had. So there you go, a window into Susie's brain. Okay. Now, so Marilyn Monroe was the, would she have been the celebrity? Would you would have wanted to see you boast in that mirror? Kind of. You know, I have a few people, but she would have been one. Felt so sorry for her. poor Marilyn. And the vicious would be another one. Okay. Now, when you're at home, do you like, do you have like a paper that you put over in the middle of the night? I just avoid, I avoid, I avoid. Okay. I... So yeah, like you were saying, you, your brain's like, oh, just, just one peak. That, that's, that would be me. <laughs> on occasion, on, by accident, it will happen that I've glanced and then I quickly go, ah! you know, like Superman and Kryptonite, but I, um, but I've never seen anything. But this house is not a dead cat in it, a ghost. Okay, so you're gonna see fluffers in the mirror sometime. At some point, but it'll be like lit up eyes. Oh, like cat's eye, okay. <laughs> yeah, big bangs. Oh gosh, oh no. I feel like that that's nightmare, nightmare fuel. Like if I had that superstition, I'd just, I'd be like, I'd accidentally look in the mirror so often. Well, see, now you're gonna have it. And now you're gonna, <laughs> Like we moved into this new house here and we have mirrored closet doors, double closet doors and they're mirrored. They're open all the time. There's no yeah. can't glance into them. That's, I would, uh, yeah, that's a good, good decision. Yeah. Okay. To the, to the bottles of uh, wine for a minute, just, just that portrayal of different temptations in the film. I thought that was fascinating. If you wanted to, to speak to that a bit more and just how you handle that. I'm sorry, I must have missed the beginning of that. The what was temp what was Oh just, just sorry. Just the like the portrayals of the different temptations in the film with the alcoholism and then the other temptations of Owen. Oh, how interesting. Okay. Um yeah, we've all got our vices in a sense, right? You don't want to call what Owen has a vice necessarily, but but it is something he can't break away from. There's that one great line, which I won't repeat here, where he just kind of comes clean about it when he's at the door. Um, and as for her, you know, I, I guess you can say that is, you know, how she's ruining her life better than how he's ruining more than his life. You, you, you know, like how do these addictions, these 
these dark needs, these dark cravings, you know, does it matter whose life is being ruined? There's still, it's still about this thing inside you that you don't want to do, that you just continue to do. Okay. And of course, given where they are in the setting of the hotel, um, there is obviously levels of worse and better. There's a measurement there. Yeah, and just to your point too, like just like how sinister that wine is. I just took that as just like temptation, you know? Absolutely. Cool. Well, and this idea that um, something is testing you and it just keeps showing up to continue to test you. Like how how badly do you actually want things to be different? It's thought provoking. I can't talk. Thought provoking. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, so my last one is, what was it like getting Michael Eklund for this film? Um, he's been uh, in four of my movies. He's one of my closest friends. Um, okay. We either text or chat probably every, well, not every day, probably every two days. And he's a, a wonderful, you know, when you hear about actors and I, I hate hearing that actors I love are like dicks. Like I hate it. So whenever I hear that an actor I love is a kind person, I, I just, I'm, I'm grateful because it allows me to keep this vision of, of what they are. And Michael is one of the kindest, most gentle, uh, giving people uh, and talented that I've ever worked with. And I'll probably work with him many, many, many more times. Okay. And he's cheap. No, just kidding. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So he's kind of like your little uh, director trademark, I guess? He's my Mia Farrow. Okay. Okay, awesome. Sorry, I guess I didn't do research, as much research as I should have into your filmography, otherwise I would have, I would have known that. Any chance I can talk him up, I will take it. Okay. Well, let, let's pretend that was planned then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and so I'll just, do you guys want to plug what's next or just plug the, the when this was released on demand? Because I, I think it's out now. Right, yeah, Carol? I feel like Colin should just take it from here. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, Brighto Road, it's available on VOD across Canada and the US uh, as of January 12th. And uh, our next project um, is called Romy, and it's based on a short film that Susie and Robert did uh, that uh, won some awards, got a lot of attention, and so we've turned it into a feature. And so we are um, gearing up to uh, to shoot it late spring, early summer. Okay, very exciting. So director Robert Cuffley, writer Susie Maloney, and producer Colin Sheldon. Thank you very much for coming on the Film Crazy Show to Shad Bright Hill Road. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us.